question I usually ask is, um, what kind of music were you playing when you first became proficient on the guitar? Well, <laughs> I take issue with the second part of that. Because uh, I never thought that at some point I became proficient. I think it's always been a little bit of a struggle. I think I've had this feeling that music came easier for other people my whole life, which might be true or maybe not. I don't know. You can't be other people. But, you know, honestly, it just feels like the more I learn, the more I realize I need to learn other things or the more I learn, the more I realize my weaknesses and it's like, oh, well, I can't really do that very well. So, uh, well, I think I, everybody, I, I think everybody feels that way. I, yeah. I'm talking more like what kind of music were you playing when you first started playing in bands? Let's Oh, so. just, uh, everything from REO Speedwagon, uh, uh, what was that? Riding the storm out. That. Okay. Let me turn this delay off. Uh, yeah, just corny stuff that was on the radio to Mr. Magic, um, Grover Washington, kind of hits that were floating around my junior high school. I would say, you know, Led Zeppelin riffs. Just originally, I just. None of us were good enough to figure out a whole song, but we could figure out like the main riffs and then we'd just vamp on that. Then I would say around age 14 or 15, I started to kind of get it together where I could play an entire song and learn stuff off records. And um, that started when I joined the high school jazz band when I was a sophomore. And um, I got really into music theory. Well, I had studied classical guitar when I was really little, and they tried to teach me theory, but I didn't understand the relevance of it, and it didn't make any sense. And it wasn't until I started to try to figure out how to improvise and how you could avoid wrong notes, especially if the harmonies were moving around, like with chord changes. Um, like, I could hear that people could outline chords and play cool sounding notes, but I couldn't really figure out how to do that. I guess if I had had, had perfect pitch, um, I would have just been able to, but as a mortal, I needed the crutch of theory. So I started really getting into music theory, I think, let's see, that was, uh, yeah, when I was 15. I just went to the library and got these theory books and more particularly, uh, jazz improvising book like this kind of well-known one that you probably have heard of by Jerry Coker because there weren't that many at that time this is obviously pre-internet and there were, it seemed like there were a finite number of resources there was like the David Baker books and this Jerry Coker book uh, maybe Gunther Schuller had something I can't remember but I'd also read Downbeat and Guitar Player like the Howard Roberts columns about guide tones, you know, the keynotes of chords. And uh, so I got into theory and then made my own big chord book where I just thought about every possible way you could play like a major seven chord or dominant seven flat nine. And I had this job in the mailroom of my dad's architectural office where most of the time I wasn't doing anything. I was just sitting there. So I would just sort of imagine the guitar fretboard in my mind and think of ways to play, like conceivable ways that you could play a chord. Different inversions, basically. And then when I would get home, I would test out those inversions and bubble the ones that sounded good and put an X through the ones that didn't. Uh, you know, because some voicings just at least on their own, they don't sound that great. So I kind of discovered voicings and playing chords just by learning about chord construction and what notes go into a chord and then making up my own chord book, which was really useful. It's much better than, I think, buying, you know, a thousand and one chords or whatever that book is and not really being aware of which notes you're playing of the chord. Anyway, then I joined the high school jazz band that just had chord changes, you know, like normal. 
And that's when I think I really, I guess you could say I got proficient around then. And I started studying with a really great guitar player in St. Louis named Peter Mayer. And, you know, going over modes and attempting to play over changes and everything. Not that I got so great at it, but it was, I got a lot better at it through that exposure, through taking, I guess you'd call it jazz guitar lessons. But you're known, I, I think it's fair to say, as something of a rhythm specialist. Well, yeah, that sort of just happened by default, I think, because I grew up uh, around a lot of black music, um, and that was kind of what the guitar did. So I played, aside from the jazz group, I was in kind of a, or I guess you'd call it a top 40 band, but the top 40 was like black-oriented top 40. So it was like, it was the late 70s, it was like 79, 80 that time. And so it was a lot of stuff that was on the radio, Earth, Wind & Fire, Chic, uh, Taste of Honey, Cameo, you know, all that late 70s, early 80s funk stuff. And that was just the way, what the guitar did. It was shanking away or playing up high, these little chords. Um, and other guitar players in my high school played that way. And of, often your biggest influences are the people you know who also play the same in instrument, or you go check them out, and it's like, oh, that's cool, how does he do that? And, and so that was kind of my exposure, and that somehow, that was kind of low on the totem pole. I didn't really think about learning to play that way, it's just, that's what you did, and I wanted to learn the fancy stuff, like playing over changes, which seemed so much harder. But playing rhythm guitar was, well, that, that's the bare bones function that you need to do to play in a group. Um, so, and then I guess that served me well after I moved to California, which is, I know you lived out there for a while too. And you probably remember there was a big world beat scene. I don't, I don't know when you moved out there. Yeah, but it was going on when I was there. It was really big. Yeah, so this is like after I graduated UC Berkeley, um, in the late 80s, there, was, there were these different African bands. And a lot of that is just all about hypnotic, repetitive rhythms. And so I got into some of those bands and was playing, like, basically it was kind of Afrobeat or Afropop. And uh, that just felt like this natural extension or natural connection to uh funk and soul music to me and then i played a lot of caribbean music and again it was rhythm guitar i mean i think rhythm guitar that's what guitar players are doing most of the time if you play in a band um, yet people shift a lot of their attention to the spotlight time when they're soloing because it's the way guitarists prove themselves and everything but yeah i would say the rhythm guitar happened both through playing in funk bands in high school and later on African and Caribbean bands. Were you playing the uh, in the African bands, were you playing the high life type stuff, a lot of individual note line type things? Yeah, it was mixed up. It was that, but then it was also kind of fella-esque um, rhythm guitar. Let me get a pick so I can play some things. I should have more picks lying around, but the ones I have I don't like. So Okay, so... Um, there's also a commonality in the long, a lot of the harmony between some of the African music and, uh, and, and funk stuff. I mean, a lot of fella tunes, for instance, are in this Dorian kind of mode. That kind of thing. Um, where it's, a, it's like a minor chord where you're playing the major sixth a lot and the minor seven. And that's... You know, obviously that a lot of funk music employs the same thing. So to me, that was all kind of the same, and African music wasn't very foreign, at least that kind of rhythm guitar playing in African music. Um, but yeah, there was high life and rhythm guitar, just depending on the tune. And usually there were two guitars in the band, so usually one was playing rhythm, and that was usually me. <laughs> uh, and then someone else was playing some sort of single note line, either down low, a tenor guitar line, they called it, you know, 
have some sort of usually voice low like that. Uh, but sometimes it was high life where you're arpeggiating chords and improvising like that. Or, or sometimes it was more spelled out, the high life lines. Like one person has a pretty specific line they're playing, and then the other person is weaving in and out of that. Did you have to work on your cross-picking technique to do that kind of stuff? Because it seems like <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot of that going on in the high life type stuff. Yeah, I didn't know, not really, because I didn't, I didn't really have any guidance. I didn't know how you're supposed to play that stuff. Like usually someone would just show me and then I'd just figure out my own way. So it wasn't so much, it was usually just alternate picking rather than, by cross picking you mean using your third finger and No, stuff? no, no, I mean like, I mean alternate picking, like oh. picking across the strings and I was having to yeah. like jump strings for that. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, but I've always, you know, that's obviously uh, uh, something guitar players need to work on. So I was always making up exercises that had that in there. Um, these, that type of cross picking and string skipping, and then the fringe benefit would be that those high life lines could become easier. Right. And you work. Um, we should talk about how you work on your rhythm playing because you have um, you have an app that we should yeah. mention. Um, and how did? But you began by working with a metronome before you developed this app. Yeah, I don't know if I worked with a metronome any more than a typical musician, but one thing I did from years ago, as soon as I um, had a drum machine, I think, is I would program basically a click, one sound, a snare drum or something. But then I, I thought, well, it should drop out and leave me on my own so that I can assess if I'm rushing or dragging or just force myself to internalize the time rather than constantly listening to this external uh, clock. So I, I would do that. Then later on when computers came into the picture, I, I remember programming a really long uh, pattern in reason, just quarter notes. And then I would go through there and kind of randomly delete a bunch of the quarter notes. So. I couldn't, there, it wasn't really a pattern. It wasn't like one measure on and one measure off. So it was kind of unpredictable. And I just practiced everything with that. Not only rhythm guitar, but scales, uh, whatever I was practicing, I would, I would often use that because that seemed to make more sense to me than a metronome. And also, it, if you want, it allows you to sort of bend the time a little bit, but still try to feel it internally or have a sense of, when you're pushing or pulling back, um, and it because of that, it seemed like maybe more musical too. That you're not always adhering to this grid. I mean, obviously, you have to. If you pull back, you have to push forward to come back in together. Um, so yeah, I was doing that, and then then at some point, I had this idea. I would say it was in the '90s, like it was before smartphones and anything but I thought why doesn't someone make a metronome that just does this that has this function and I actually kind of looked into how do you even get something manufactured and I kind of looked into it and looked into patents and it just seemed like such an uphill battle for an individual to figure out how you make a metronome in China or wherever and right. and find people who would know how to implement that function I mean I didn't know but then when smartphones came into the picture it seemed like, well, here's the hardware's all ready to go. It's this little device. Right. So, so how hard can it be to just implement this random mute function? It was the original idea. And uh, do you know Bruce Buchanan? And a yeah. uh, friend of mine out in California, he's a guitar player. We actually played in African bands together. Um, but he became a computer programmer. And so I was talking with him and, and told him about the concept. He said, yeah, that should be easy to program. And he got back to me like in 15 or 20 minutes with a just a super simple metronome that randomly muted. Uh, I think he built it in Java and he emailed it to me. And it was kind of like proof of concept. Yeah, this is something that's totally doable. And then it was, uh, I think it was was this? It was the winter of 2010 going into 2011. 
where New York just had this massive snowstorm. I can't remember if you, I think you were still here then. And so then I, I was just told in my apartment, no one was going out. I thought, well, this is a perfect opportunity to get serious about this little idea I've had. And then I, I researched programmers, freelance developers, because I'm not a programmer. Um, at this point, I can get into Xcode, the iPhone programming environment, and tinker around and do graphics, but I'm not a programmer. So I found um, a couple of people to help me out with this project, and then within a few, well, within a few days, the preliminary build was done. And then it took a, a few months to get all the kinks ironed out and get it uploaded to Apple. And so it was a learning process. But yeah, so that's the trajectory. So I used to play with a metronome that does a lot of the things that uh, Time Guru, this app, does. Cool, and it's available on uh, iTunes. Yeah, and it's for Android too, so you can okay. get it whichever platform. How's it it's doing? Not, yeah. <laughs> How's it doing? How's it? It's doing well. I, you know, I, once once it kind of got some traction and and got off the ground. Yeah, I've been really happy with it. It's kind of like royalties, you know, where you've right. done the work a long time ago, and then it's just kind of like free money, mailbox money. Yeah, I mean, I'm not gonna retire off it or anything but, it, but it's uh it's it's doing well i mean every once in a while i have to um do updates or if there's a feature that enough people are clamoring about but i think at this point most of the things that i think are useful are already implemented in it so there's preset saving and you can reorder the presets and i think there's enough sound choices to satisfy most people um I think the one request that I've gotten a lot that I'm hesitant to implement is having the metronome gradually speed up. Oh, so, no. <laughs> that's enough yeah. of a problem already. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, I don't know if that's... I think that's for practicing a, a scale or a pattern and just not having to reach over and, and yeah. push up the tempo. But from my perspective, it's like, well, how hard is it to just, you know, stop and bump it up a couple of notches? But that's probably the one feature that... I've gotten the most requests for. But every once in a while, uh, there's a bug that pops up that you have to deal with, either because Apple changes something. Like, I get nervous every time there's a new iOS released oh, yeah. because almost inevitably there's some problem. This last one, iOS 9, everything seems to be okay. And with my other app, I have another app out now called Voxbeat, which is like a multi-track looper um, which has a novel function where you can program beats just by beatboxing. So it knows how, more or less, how to interpret your kick, snare, and hi-hat sounds and subdivide it into three tracks and assign hi-hat, kick, and snare sound to it. So right. boom, tots, boom, you know, it right, right. take that. Does it quantize it? it? Yeah, it can or it can't. I mean, it's up to you. If you, it just depends on the setting. So a lot of it is laid out just like a typical uh, multi-track with the swing feature, the quantize, um, you know, a mixer. You've got effects. So it's a both a drum machine and an audio looper, and it has six tracks total right now. Though the I'm working on an iPad version, which will have more tracks. But it's a real handy way of getting down your musical ideas, and it's very quick, So, which was kind of the idea. It's like, well, rather than programming a beat, what if you just sing the beat that's in your head? Anyway, and, uh, so Voxbeat is the name of the app. It's just an iPhone right now. That just came out, and but I haven't yet tried to uh, really market it other than mentioning it on Facebook. But, well, I guess I'm marketing it right now. <laughs> Yeah, Sorry. You, but, this is uh, worldwide, baby. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, for what, for whatever extent it is. Well, yeah. that leads perfectly though into the next uh, phase, which is uh, at what point did you start incorporating the laptop and Ableton and things like that into your performance? Um, I let's see. Well, I've been using Ableton Live since I think version two. I mean, for years now. So that must have been like 2001, or I think, or 2002. It's been a while now. What happened is when I started playing with Sco, um, originally I was just playing guitar. 
and it was supposed to be kind of a, a, a short tour where I was just playing rhythm guitar and his overdub parts on a record called Bump that he did, where he had he, he himself played a lot of the guitar harmonies and backup parts. So he needed someone to do that live. But also on that record was a guy, a samplist, um, who was in this band Soul Coughing, Mark DiLeAnthony, or DiLeAnthony, I forget how you pronounce his last name. Anyway, he played a lot of washy and weird sounds on that record. Um, not beats or anything, just textures. And he did some of the gigs that we did, like the bigger gigs, but he wasn't there for all of it. So Ben Porowski, the drummer at the time, was filling in when Mark couldn't do it, and he had a little Boss Doctor sample. And then Ben couldn't do some of the gigs, so I started working the Boss Doctor sample and got pretty into it. And then Ben came back, and I thought, well, this is cool, and I got a, a Korg sampling drum machine, the ES-1, and we started using that on stage. So it started with the Boss Doctor sample and this, and then Adam Deitch took over the drum chair from Ben, and then, that, so that was 2001, then I started really using the Boss Doctor sample, but not for a guitar. It was just kind of separate. I did have a MIDI floor controller where I could trigger sounds, but it wasn't linked to the guitar. And then, uh, uh, sorry, I'm giving you a long answer, but no, this is, I'll all, get to the this point. Is good stuff. Yeah, I'm also just trying to remember how this all happened. I, uh, I got an iBook. I guess it was 2001 or 2002, because it just seemed like the Boss Doctor sample was so limited with its memory, what it could do. And I found out about um, Ableton Live. It's like, wow, this is like an infinite boss doctor sample where you can trigger samples, but you can do all kinds of other stuff and you can sync it with beats and change the pitch easily or slow it down. You can do anything you want. It seemed like, um, but I didn't really start in a live setting running the guitar through the laptop and see, let me, let me think about this. But we don't need an exact timeline as yeah. what, what yeah. prompted it, you to it do it. It may have been much more recently yeah. than I remember. Um, I mean, I was, I was playing guitar and running a laptop and changing uh, patterns and whatnot, but I don't think I ran my guitar through it until, I mean, in a, in a live setting, really, until like 2013. Because the SCO band didn't play from 2000 five essentially to 2013 and in that time computers got a lot better and you could run interfaces at a lower latency I mean one of the things to me that's been something that I've long wanted to be better is just the latency the lag between when you hit a note and when it comes out of your interface if you're running through your software and um, so it just, especially as a rhythm guitar player, it just felt really annoying to have even, you know, eight milliseconds of, of latency. You could, you could feel it, and it felt unnatural. So it was only, I think, when I could get the buffer down to 64 samples yeah. and not have the computer die and not crackle and all that. So I think it was probably 2013, but then I started... You know, um, just figuring out like what are what are the cool things that you can do now that you can play through the computer and not have too much latency and then it just started to seem like wow this is like the effects processor of your dreams it's it'll do anything that you can think of um, so yeah and then but you know I also wanted to try to make the computer do things that were off the beaten path that you can't really do with pedals or that you can't do with a without a rack of studio gear gates and whatnot and and ways of connecting things so um, 
Yeah, I started to do this, uh, like, the different ways I use the laptop. Uh, one was running the, the guitar into the computer, but having the guitar signal side-chained by a gate to another track. So um, the other track only sounds when I hit the guitar. I can give you a demonstration of that. This might be also on uh, on YouTube on some things, but I'll just play it anyway. So, for instance, I'll have a, a track. In this case, it's um, can you hear that beat? Yeah. So there's a beat, and then there's. Um, Adam Deitch is rapping on this, and I've got it on a loop. And the guitar, it will open the gate that's in front of the rap. So let me see if I turn it up a little bit. So, I'm just holding a chord, and that opens the gate. But I can also play with the, the rap and do rhythmic things. So... You know, so I can do that kind of thing. So I'm using the guitar as basically a, a drum pad or something that opens the gate. It's not really doing anything melodic. You can also do something like that. Now, in this case, I've got a clavinet pattern that's going that it's, it's just a clavinet loop um, from some record, I think. So it's just a little pattern, but I can control which parts of the pattern are audible. Now the guitar is totally muted there, so it's um, there's no guitar blended in. But then I'll also do similar things. Let's see if this will work. Um, So can you hear that note? Yeah. In uh, you might need to control the balances here. So you, it's set up for like going through a PA, but it's obviously not a PA. So all that's happening there is there's actually a, a held note on a clavinet on one track in Ableton Live with a gate in front of it again. And the gate is being, is, so when I play something, the gate opens up in accordance with the rhythm I'm playing and then creates this low note in the same rhythm that I'm playing. So it's a way of kind of, it's like a pedal tone that follows whatever I'm playing. So, but I like this gate concept, which I actually stole from Niall Rogers. I was reading an article about how on one of their big hits, I think it's Dance, Dance, Dance or something, there's a, a clavinet solo that's super funky, but it turns out that the guy that was hired to come do the solo couldn't really get it together. He wasn't <laughs> playing, playing rhythmically enough. And so they said, okay, just, just play some held chords. Don't play rhythmically. And then they had Nile Rodgers, or they stuck a gate in front of it, side-chained to Nile Rodgers' guitar. And so whatever Nile played was the rhythm. Right. And the chords are what the clav player played. So I thought, wow, that's an incredible concept. So I, I use that a lot. I want to get into some of the other stuff you're doing, but I want to backtrack a little bit because a lot of the technical details I find really interesting and it's stuff I've dealt with and I know other people deal with. Yeah. Um, first of all, how do you run all that stuff? And I know you're running um, MIDI guitar also, which we'll yeah. get into. How do you get all that stuff to run at 64 samples? Uh, well, that's pushing the limits and most of the time everything is fine but I have a, um, a Thunderbolt interface it's the Zoom Tac 2 okay. um, which is amazing for latency 
Um, I think at 64 sample buffer, I measured something like three or maybe four milliseconds. I can't remember. Round trip latency. Wow. And previously, the best I could do with a US inter USB interface was maybe nine milliseconds or something. And that's either even at 64? Yeah, so it's running at 64. I can't seem to go any lower than that. But I'm also, it, this might be partially why, I've actually got it set up as an aggregate device. I don't know if you know what that is, but in OS X, um, in the audio MIDI setup, you can actually combine and link two interfaces. So since the Zoom is only a two-channel device, unfortunately, um, I needed extra output so I can go to my guitar amp, but I can also so I can also go to the PA as well as the guitar amp. And so I've got an aggregate device where the built-in audio of the Mac goes to the PA and then an audio out goes from the Zoom to my amp. Um, that can be a little dicey. <laughs> I've had that do bizarre things on a couple, only on like one or two occasions where there'll be a dropout for a second or something and it's like, I don't know what just happened, but and then it comes back, it's like, uh, okay, well that makes me nervous. Right. But most of the time it works out, so it's kind of work, worth the risk. Um, are you sending separate things to your amp in the PA, or are you using your amp to monitor what's going to the PA? Uh, both. It just depends on the tune. Um, mostly it's separate, but sometimes um, sometimes it's kind of split where I think, oh, well, I, it would be great to have this guitar sound be stereo. So I'll send, you know, if it's a stereo effect or some sort of ping pong delay, say well let's put it through my amp but also through the the PA and then when when I was playing with Sco doing stuff like that sometimes we tweak the balances with the sound man so he's like oh you're giving me too much and I'll I'll just dial it back um, and how powerful is your computer I mean it's a well this we one is a pretty recent model MacBook Pro but it's just it's an i5 um, but it has 8 megs of RAM and a 512 solid-state hard drive. Okay, so it's a solid-state hard drive. Yeah, which makes a big difference, yeah. I think. Um, but yeah, the, the, I'm very excited about these Thunderbolt interfaces because they all seem to have really low latency. The, there's a Focusrite one that's coming out that I'm hoping to check out only because that way I won't have to do this aggregate device thing because it has four outputs. I think they call it the Claret 2 Pre or something like that. But yeah, Thunderbolt to me otherwise is kind of a pain in the ass, but it's somehow turned out to be great for audio interfaces. That's, that's interesting. Um, yeah, well, getting back to, um, the, oh, well, I wanted to ask you about how you're controlling all this stuff. I, you're using the 12, Keith McMillan 12 step, and we may have talked about this. Yeah. As opposed to the soft step, and I was con I was uh, wondering why you chose that instead of the soft step. Because it has 12 buttons rather than 10. Uh, okay. That's, that's almost the only reason. Um, I also liked, at the time, they may have changed this with the recent soft step, but I think this one has uh, the top row is raised, and so it just was a little more ergonometric or ergonomic, whatever the word is. Right. Um, and I also liked that it was laid out like a keyboard. Somehow I could remember notes better than numbers. All right, okay. This so, sound is B-flat. Yeah, and also the soft step has all this XY capability, and I just didn't think I was really going to do that. It, it's, it's, there's enough things that can go wrong with this setup <laughs> that I, I just didn't need to add on to it. Right. But it, it, it's uh, I love these uh, these McMillan controllers. They're really handy because they're so compact, lightweight, and bus powered. Right. Um, and so you're using. Um, you mentioned something about a pitch shifter and arpeggiator. Yeah. That you process your guitar note with. How does that work? Uh, well, I'll show you. Um, let's see. Let me open up another session over here. Okay. So. 
there's a straight guitar signal. So on this, in this case, I've got a bunch of different, well, let me turn, I'll just show you. So this is just an Ableton Live session. Can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so here's the guitar direct track. Um, I can mute or uh, tracks as I want to, but each track has a different effect on it. So one of them, so I've got my straight guitar sound, but I've also got this. If I mute the... And to enable that sound, you're just unmuting well, what that that's track? Doing, this is a little complicated, so <laughs> I'll try to see if I can explain it. So the guitar signal goes into the computer. It goes into a pitch wheel plug-in that's just called pitch wheel. And the pitch of the, it's, it's sort of like a turntable dial, looks like that. But the cool thing about this pitch wheel plug-in is it responds to MIDI commands. So I have an arpeggiator running that spins the pitch wheel around in a pattern. I don't know if it's, it's moving so fast, but here's the plug-in. Is that the Ableton arpeggiator you're using? Yeah, the Ableton arpeggiator. Yeah. and the, I forget who makes this. Oh, it's called Quick Quack. Really cool plug-in, pitch wheel. But it's, it's zooming around really fast because it's being controlled by the arpeggiator. Right. And it's simply set to a minor arpeggio. Let me turn off the delay so it's a little less uh, nebulous here. Why is that still going? Somehow the delay is still on. Let me see where that's coming from. Yeah, there we go. And I, I, I stole this uh, sound in a way, or I recreated. There's a band called uh, Little Dragon, I think, that has some tune where the breakdown has something that sounds really similar to this. And I thought, man, that's really cool sounding. And I was dating this girl at the time who really loved the band. She's like, Avi, how do they do that? And it's like, I don't know. <laughs> but I, went, I, I think you could probably recreate that. And so that's... I, I just thought it was a cool sound. Um, so that's one way that I use this uh, pitch wheel plug-in. Let me see if I've got... Let me bring up another tune that has that. Um, and this is actually a, a tune that I do with Sco. It's called Curtis New. Let me turn my amp down a bit. And uh, this isn't on the record. This is something I kind of discovered later on. But so I thought, well, with this pitch wheel plug in, maybe I can just play a note and have the pitch wheel spin around in a particular key. So it's like uh, the computer is improvising and I don't have to do anything. All I have to do is play one note and then the pitch wheel will handle randomly playing notes in a key. So you'll see what I'm, I'm talking about in a second. So. so I'm just hitting one note. That's all the pitch wheel. Now I could, if I hit a button, it randomizes the pitch. But it's all in a Dorian mode. I was gonna say, is it still? It's still within a key. Right. So with the Ableton has all these interesting um, MIDI effect plugins. So with different functions. So when I step on the 12 step, it's linked to uh, an Ableton MIDI effect that has a randomizer function. So it makes the 
notes of the arpeggiator rather than in a pattern, it scrambles them. So it's still getting arpeggiated, but the note choices don't follow a, a set pattern. And then that goes to the pitch wheel that moves around in accordance with the random MIDI notes. So the arpeggiator can actually pick specific pitches out of that pitch wheel. Yeah, the pitch wheel follows MIDI notes. So I think you could, if you wanted to, that pitch wheel could respond to a keyboard, for instance, or, uh, which I haven't done, but you could use MIDI guitar, right. then MIDI notes to control the, the pitches on the pitch wheel. The pitch wheel is just a pitch shifter, but a very good one and very uh, different because it responds to MIDI notes. Is it is it gen what is this what is the actual sound being does it generate the actual sound we're hearing Yeah here? like uh, let's see if I can show you here um, Oh that's something else hold on It's kind of artificial sounding but it's actually Okay now it's stuck on some other pitch let me see if I can So I'm actually playing a B but it's sounding like an A, so it's actually a whole step lower. But here's the sound of the pitch wheel. So that's an A chord, but it's probably sounding like a G. So here's a... So that's that's actually just the pure dry output of this pitch wheel plugin, which I could uh, see. I'll I'll change the pitch real quick. Now this pitch wheel, I guess it, it's doing so much that it introduces a fair amount of latency. It's enough to play, but it's much more than like a whammy pedal or something. Right. Now, is it responding now to the audio coming in as opposed to MIDI? Yeah, this has nothing to do with MIDI right now. Right. The MIDI, since it's an arpeggiator, only runs when the transport of Ableton Live is going, and right now it's stopped. So this pitch wheel is just stuck on a, on a, on a pitch. But I can... Right. See, I'm moving it with my mouse right now. And I think you can do it so that it's smooth. Yeah. That's awesome. But the pitch was changing as you played also. Well, before it was, yeah. Um, well, right now I'm just hitting a... So now I'm just moving the pitch just like a turntable is probably the best analogy. Right. Or a pitch bender on a synth. Right. Right, but it you can do it so that it's it's kind of uh, like a whammy pedal where it's a smooth transition between pitches, or you can set it so that it's not smooth and it's just discrete. Right, right, but so now now I'm back to where I started. So that's the pattern, the basic arpeggiator pattern. Then I hit again, I hit this and it randomizes it. Anyway, it works in the context of the band. We just get nutty and uh, then that transitions into this kind of Miles Davis esque jam. <laughs> okay. But, you know, it, I wish I had thought of this before when we did the record because it works out well for the tune. Also in that tune, I, I do more conventional stuff with, where I'm using MIDI guitar just with a synth sound. So like... So that's now is that stuff. using the MIDI guitar plug -in? Yeah. Yeah, the MIDI guitar plug-in that gets routed to a synth sound in Ableton Live. And I think with that one, 
I've got, uh, how am I doing that? Oh, I think I'm using this plugin called Big Sequencer or something. Some, I'm doing something where it's getting chopped up in a pattern. I can't remember. Like a lot of these things, you know, you set it up, you save it, and then you have no idea. <laughs> you, <laughs> I did. You found what the specific formula. So um, that's not an arpeggiator. That's like that. That's not an arpeggiator. I think it's. Let me see here. Let me. Yeah, it's a plugin called uh, by Audio Damage called um, Big Sequence Two or Big Seq Two. I don't know how you say it, but a really cool company, Audio Damage, and it, it's a lot like the Boss Slicer pedal. Right. Right. But. Right you can do more. It's just, you know, a, a step filter, essentially. Right. Yeah, they make so, that great delay, the dub delay, which right, right. I had to switch to when my new computer wouldn't run any of the Tal Togu stuff anymore. Right, uh -oh. yeah. Because that was the best delay ever. Was the Tal delay? Did you ever run that? Free I did, delay? yeah. That was really good. And it won't, uh, it won't run in, uh, it's not supported anymore, so it won't run in Right, I think I discovered that too, yeah, unfortunately. Sorry. But they make amazing stuff too, that company. Cool, what other samples are you triggering with a MIDI um, guitar? Um, well, let me go back to this one here. Uh, you know, oh, one, one, another interesting thing I've, I've done, let me, I'll, let me see if I can call this up, hold on. Well, first, while I'm here, uh, so with this one, I've got vibes. Um, I have, uh, it set up so that I can also do, oh, this is with the pitch wheel. So this is, um, just fifths. That's not MIDI guitar. That's just... See what else have I got? Uh, I've got an organ sound here. Um, um, Do you find that the MIDI guitar, the latency, is workable for? Pretty good. This MIDI guitar too. It's pretty amazing. I mean, I just would have never thought that it would be possible to do this without an interface. I mean, uh, what do you call it? A uh, MIDI pickup. Right. I don't know if you can hear the straight guitar. I'll, I'll blend in. Well, you, can, you can actually hear the um, you can actually hear the string noise. So you can yeah. Hear the okay. Well, now it's going. The straight guitar is going through the amp, and it's. Oh, this this patch cuts off at a certain point because some old like a Vox Continental that right. doesn't have that many low notes, but. Yeah, it's it's pretty good. I mean, I don't really like that kind of stacked fusiony sound where it's you know you can't decide on one sound, so you stack a bunch together. <laughs> so I don't think I I blend it like that unless I was just playing a melody, a little part. Um, but to me, it's it's kind of good enough. I mean, yeah, it, it's the latency super low. I don't know what it is. Probably like. 15 milliseconds or something but I, in MIDI guitar I also have it set about as low as it can go the buffer is 96 samples when I go any lower it starts to cause problems somehow right I think it's partially because I've got this aggregate device going which is not you're asking for it <laughs> are you changing you changing the buffer of the computer or you mean the buffer of MIDI guitar yeah, buffer of MIDI guitar, right. but it, there's a buffer size setting in MIDI guitar. Right. Um, so I've got it set. The default, for some reason, when it comes up, I think it's like 512, which is unusable. Right. But it, it'll go down. This one will go down to 16 samples. I think, I mean, we can see what happens if I do that, <laughs> but I think it's not going to work. Um, so right now it's set to 96 samples, and that seems to work well. Uh, let me pull up this other thing I've been doing where I use the compute, the vocoder. 
the Ableton Live vocoder. You know, with all this, it, it's pretty cool, but I always feel like, shit, I'm just scratching the surface because the, you can just keep going with... Oh, it's endless. It... I mean, then the real trick becomes, well, how do you use this that's not in a way that's not too obnoxious that um, that works with a band that you're playing with? So this one is kind of cool, I think. So I've just got a guide beat, but... Um, Hopefully that, let's see here, figure out why I'm not hearing that. Hmm. Oh, it's because I quit MIDI guitar. All right, now it'll work. Awesome. I knew you were the end of the time, no more seasons left. So, so what that are you just, free? <laughs> exactly. I've got like I have uh, twenty different phrases that I made up, um, and it's me just talking, which I'm not going to play. But right. uh, that's I'm using the Ableton Live vocoder, so uh, it, it's kind of a similar thing to the gate thing, where it only sounds when you play. Like the loop is actually going now, but you're not going to hear it until I play the guitar. Guitar, but the guitar is not the guitar, it's MIDI guitar. So it goes guitar to MIDI guitar to Ableton Live synth to a vocoder track that has these stock, these prefab phase, uh, phrases going. And so I can just play any harmony I want. You know, or I could play single notes, but I can also change phrases. Let's see. Let me find something better here. Are those on different clips that you trigger? Yeah, so. And the reason I'm doing this rather than having a mic go into the interface is because in a live setting, like I play at New Blue a lot, which is where I've done this, there's too much, you know, it's going to pick up drums. It, it just gets so messy. Right, right. So a way around it is to just have pre-made uh, spoken phrases. But can that, you why are can you not trigger those with just the guitar? Why do you need the MIDI uh, the MIDI guitar to do that? Well, you don't really. You could you could. Um, it's just a different. Uh, it, texture. it just sounds a lot. It just sounds a lot better. Somehow, when the guitar is the carrier signal, it it doesn't sound as good to me. Okay. Uh, it sounds much more like a classic vocoder if you've got a synth doing it, which that so that's the reason I'm I'm doing that. Now maybe I could get it together and have uh, the vocoder respond in a better way to the guitar signal, but I haven't figured out that yet. Right. Well, it is more classic using a synth, I guess, because that's right. what they use. Yeah, and you can change synth sounds, so I've got a couple of different ones. Um, the, the one unfortunate thing right now is uh, this MIDI Guitar 2. I think it's still officially beta, and it doesn't respond to pitch bends. Right. I was going to ask you that, because, yeah, I haven't tried it. I haven't gotten any emails from them in a long time, and it's, I know, still, it's yeah. still in beta, and it doesn't do pitch bad. I know. Yeah, I just checked. It says you have the latest version of MIDI guitar. So, yeah, yeah that's a little frustrating, because a lot of the uh, vocoder sound to me is, is has pitch bends in it. Right. Yeah. Well, you, could, you could go back to one, but are you finding, I mean, the old MIDI guitar, but are you finding that the new uh, one is... This is so much, it's, much better. It's so much more usable. It responds better to chords. It doesn't glitch out with wrong notes as much. Yeah, I um, found that too. The, the latency is like five times as good. They, I don't know how they did it, but they really improved it. I don't know. Maybe it would, it's the case where they can't figure out how to implement pitch bends and have retain all the other good improvements right. that they did with MIDI Guitar 2. I don't know. Uh, but... Just for what it does, it, it's an incredible little piece of software.
as you know. Yeah. So are you, um, you're now, that was my, sort of where I was going next, which is um, you're incorporating this stuff into your own music and your own. Yeah. Uh, this is, this vocoder thing is very new. And um, I just thought, you know, at New Blue, a lot of time, most of the time it's instrumental music that I'm playing. But I thought, well, it'd be a really cool element to have some sort of vocalist or robot or words just because I think people as soon as they hear someone a, a human voice or language even if it's a foreign language people respond in a way where a lot of times instrumental music sort of is background music but if there's some words going on then it's it kind of becomes more foreground and I also thought it'd be kind of funny you know and fun and Clever. I mean, it might get played out or might get obnoxious, but I've only done it once. But I thought, it, and everyone in the band thought it was really pretty successful. And then the reason that our interview was delayed by a couple of weeks is because I took the computer to New Blue to do precisely this on a gig, run this vocoder stuff. And I think the mixing board was sending phantom power through the floor box. And we'd plug the computer in just right into the from the output of the computer to the floor box, and I think it took a uh, jolt of phantom power. I think that's what happened. Oh, DI, because, yeah. No, it wasn't DI'd, it just was right into the floor box. You mean the, the in, somehow coming through the The, the floor the box of the snake, yeah, like so the mixer has a snake connected to it okay. with the mic inputs just on a, at the end of the snake. And, oh, and I see, yeah. And, uh, I didn't know that it was possible to send phantom power through through a snake through the through the quarter inch inputs on the snake. I think that's what happened because oddly enough, I fried my iPhone a, a year or two ago doing the same thing at New Blue, where I just wanted to plug it in to their system. So maybe there's a funky wiring or something. I don't know, but the computer went berserk. The sound went away, and I had to take it to Apple to get a new logic board. Oh my God. So the lesson is always use a DI. <laughs> I guess that's the lesson. But someone once told me when I started using a computer on stage, it's like, computer can always make you look bad. <laughs> and even when I see other people, I know you, you perform, or you at least when you were in New York, you did a lot of laptop stuff. I, I imagine you're still doing it, but... Sometimes when I see other musicians with a laptop or even a giant pedal board, I actually get a little nervous just <laughs> looking at them because I know the feeling of how much can go wrong and how how many, you know, all these cables can come unplugged or normally it doesn't, but still there's part of me that's always a little nervous and in the SCO band that's what made me nervous was just hoping that the computer worked and that I stepped on the right buttons and I think using a computer is different than playing an instrument when you're playing music because you have to think ahead a lot. With an instrument there's kind of this connection and a spontaneity where you know you have an idea or you're hearing something in your head and your fingers most of the time cooperate and play the right notes and with a computer it's it's not tactile in the same way it's, you know there's tiny little buttons that you have to hit on the floor and you're wearing big shoes and 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 you have to think in advance you know what what section is coming up and what what button do i need to press it's it's a different different mindset. I don't know, maybe there's Do you think it is, or do you think it's you've been playing guitar since you're 15 years old? And, and well, that could be part of it. Because I see guys doing computer stuff that have been doing that since they're 15 years old, and it seems that they are as connected to it as, you know, we are to the guitar, to the extent yeah. we are. Yeah, I think, that, I think that's a big part of it. It's just uh, what you've spent the most time with. I think also, using a computer... It's so infinite what you can do that I think you have to have a certain amount of discipline saying, okay, well, I'm going to set it up this way with my MIDI controller, and, and this one button on my MIDI controller will always do the same thing, no matter which 
live session I have open, or uh, the the buttons on my uh, knob twiddler that I have here will always do the same thing. So you kind of set it up like a hardware device that has limitations, and you live with it, and don't always try to change it because then you never really get used to something. You never get used to the setup. Yeah, well, I've, I've heard a lot of guys talk about that, about how, you know, it's it's the danger of this system, you know, this the this the computer is that the, that the, it is unlimited, that the possibilities yeah. are unlimited. And the guys who seem to be best at doing what they do are the guys who have just said, I'm stopping here, at least for now. Yeah. This is what I've got. This These are my sounds. This is what I do. And, yeah. And I'm going to explore every single aspect of what this set of gear will do before yeah. I move on to something else. The other end of that is when I used to take a whole new pedal board out on gigs and Gary used Gary Brower used to say, Brave or stupid, you be the judge. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. mean, I mean sometimes if you're you know, if you're playing in a band where you're doing the same stuff all the time, sometimes it's fun to switch up the gear just to keep yourself interested. Yeah. And and sometimes the terror of it can come, you know, can can bring out stuff that yeah, in a rut, but but I know what you're saying. Are you performing a lot with a laptop these days? Not a lot, but more than I thought I would be in Nashville. You know, I mean, really? that's, yeah, yeah, that's that's been the big surprise. I mean, I've I've gotten to do at, at least some of it. You know, um, yeah, there's a guy down here, a great guy, um, Chris Davis, who who is who does avant garde shows down here and has had some amazing people come through and. Um, and I got to open one of the shows for him, and I've done some other stuff. I did a Second Life performance with this mm -hmm. guy down here. We, he does a steady concert in Second Life every Sunday. Yeah. And so I, and, yeah. What interface and computer are you using? Oh uh, well, I just got a brand new MacBook Pro, and I, but I was using my old MacBook Pro, which you know, what you're talking about them breaking down. I have to say, I. I have not had any more trouble with a laptop than I've had with pedals. Let's put it that way. So yeah, you know, I yeah. mean, because with the pedal board, of course, oh my God, it's not making sound. Which cable is it? You know that kind of stuff. Yeah, right. And yeah. we've all been there. And you know, even plugging straight into an amp, if the cable isn't working, yeah, you know, right. anything can happen. And I've been surprised at how little problems I've had with the computer, short of like one Warper party in New York where I forgot my guitar, you know, that, yeah. that was a problem. Yeah. Or forgot the interface or something, yeah. you know, so I had to do a basic laptop set. But yeah. are you recording any of this stuff, kind of stuff that you're doing now? So any of the new bands that you're playing with? or? Well, not really. Um, I might, though. That's kind of, I'm thinking about that. And when you say recording, I think these days... I don't know if I have the desire to put any effort into pure audio recordings. I think it, it's all, I'll videotape everything. Play live, videotape. I, I did three songs with a trio I have. Um, it's on YouTube. It's the Avi B3. But there's no laptop involved. It's just straight guitar playing. Um, but I would like to incorporate some of this stuff that we were talking about earlier, the vocoder and some of the other laptop-based effects, but I think if I record it, I'll probably rent a space, rehearse with the band a little bit, and videotape it, and do a live uh, live audio, and just put it out on YouTube for the world. For me personally, when I find out, hear about someone, I just, the first thing I do is I go to YouTube to hear what they sound like. Exactly. You know? And so it's like, well, if I'm doing that, then everyone must be doing that. And I also think that, um, well, I have a friend who does really excellent uh, live audio recording. He has a multi-track rig. His name's Rob Badnock. And he, he's very meticulous. He gets great sounds. And there's something about live audio synced to video where I think it sounds better when you can see it. Like if you just shut the video off and listen to it, the live audio is pretty good. But when you see it, I think maybe it's because we're used to seeing crappy audio with videos from iPhones and right. poor mixed videos that when you hear something that's decent and it's accompanied by video, it seems to sound better. 
So that's also part of my motivation. But I just figure, you know, if, if we're, it's just where it's everything's become so visually oriented um, that even if you're just standing there playing, people want to see it. No, it's true. I mean, I, part of that's part of it. I know I will instantly go to YouTube partly and try and find live stuff partly to see if this person can actually perform yeah. this stuff. Yeah, because I get a, I get a lot of CDs in the mail, obviously from people for review, yeah. or you know, even though I don't really review CDs per se anymore. Yeah, and and I don't half the time I don't even open up the CD until I look the person up on YouTube and see, oh, okay, this is what they sound like, and they can actually do this. Yeah, right. And, uh, and then I will, uh, you know, I mean, I still like having stuff in my iPhone. I still like to listen in the car. I still like, you know, or whatever. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's a changing world. It's funny now, though. There's when I put out Time Guru, I think the i the App Store had something like four hundred thousand apps, which seemed like a lot, but now I believe it's over a million. So if you don't try to get people to know about it, it just it's like putting out a CD and not telling anyone. No, you know, no one is going to discover it at all. Well, that's yeah. I mean, that is the world we live in. It's, it's what yeah. I call you know rising above the noise floor. You know, the yeah. noise floor has gotten quant, you know, uh, geometrically higher. Yeah. In, in recent years, so it's yeah. that's what it's all about. It's just rising above the noise, and yeah, and then it's up to marketing. You know, what else, whatever you can do. Right. So I wish you luck with that. Any other musical projects uh, that you would like uh, to check out? Well, I have some things in my head that I don't know if I'm ready to talk about because uh, it's not concrete enough. But I do want to incorporate the laptop with a group, probably um, like a four piece or something, and do some videos. Uh, I've talked about it with Andy Hess a little bit, the bass player from the Sco Band, who's down for doing stuff. But I have, I feel like I need to write some more material that can employ a laptop in a cool way, um, and that's not just um, my old stuff with the laptop glommed on. Right. So I, de I feel like I need just need to do more prep before that happens. But let me think. Uh, I just did a really cool gig or a couple of cool gigs with a band called the Ghost Train Orchestra. As that's low tech. It's music from the forties, thirty late thirties and forties, but a lot of very uh harmonically advanced and zany, almost cartoon music. That's really cool. Um are you playing acoustic with that? Like on no, top it's type electric, thing? electric guitar. But it's mostly all written out, charted out. Um, and that's fun. It's heavy reading, which is good and bad. Um, you know, hard because most guitar players are not great readers, me included. I'm an okay, I think I'm a good reader for a guitar player, but I'm a shitty reader as a musician. Right. So. Well, we, I, I always, we, you know, first of all, we're rarely required to do it. Second of all, you know, hey, a piano, you know, each note is only in one place for those right. guys. And for most instruments, the notes are only in one place, you know. Right, have, yeah. That's my but excuse. Yeah, guitar, anyway. there's a lot of options. And, mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, that's that's really fun. I'm just trying to think of what else I've been doing. I've been doing a lot of my music, actually, um, at the Tribeca Grand Hotel every Wednesday. Um, New Blue, actually two gigs a night. Tribeca Grand, then we go to New Blue and do it. And that's with uh, Aaron and Jesse from the Brazilian Girls. And this other guitar player that you might know, a really great guitar player, Liberty Elman. Oh, sure. Yeah, I know yeah. Liberty from the Bay Area. Right, from the Bay Area. He's been living in New York for a few years. Yeah. Um, he's awesome. And we have a really great connection where we do a lot of almost King Crimson-y slash African chimey guitar stuff. Um and that's that's really fun. He's very kind of rhythmic player. I don't know. We we have a nice thing. I think. What's uh, that group called? We've had so many different names. Uh, uh, we've been called Shitty Shitty Jam Band. All right, I remember. I think Aaron Johnson, the drummer, booked the gigs at New Blue, so I think it's listed as Aaron Johnson and Friends. It's a lot of the same music, kind of 
recreated with two guitars. A lot of music that I've written or um, come up with somehow. <laughs> 